This country chapel may be the earliest design of the American architect Frank Lloyd Wright. It stands in a meadow not far from where he was born in central Wisconsin in 1867. Wright's uncles farmed the rolling fields surrounding the family's land. The architect would later write that his early life in the rural Midwest put nature at the center of his vision. I think one of his missions was to create an American architecture, one that was not dependent upon other places and other times for its aesthetics. The cardboard house needed an antidote. When, in the cause of architecture, in 1893, I first began to build houses, the only way to simplify the awful building in vogue at the time was to conceive a finer entity, a better building, and get it built. The buildings standing then were all tall and all tight. Chimneys were lean and taller still, sooty fingers threatening the sky. And beside them, sticking up by way of dormers through the cruelly sharp sawtooth roofs, were the attics for the help to swelter in. Invariably, the damp, sticky clay of the prairie was dug out for a basement under the whole house and the rubble stone walls of this dank basement always stuck up above the ground a foot or more and blinked with half windows. The lean upper house walls of the usual two floors above this stone basement were wood, clapboarded and painted, or else shingled and stained, preferably shingled and mixed up and down, all together with moldings crosswise. These overdressed wood house walls had cut in them, or cut out of them to be precise, big holes for the big cat and little holes for the little cat to get in or out, or for ulterior purposes of light and air. The house walls were becorniced or bracketed up at the top into the tall, purposely, profusely complicated roof. The whole roof was scalloped and ridged and tipped and swanked and gabled to madness. The whole exterior was bedeviled, that is to say, mixed to puzzle pieces with corner boards, panel boards, window frames, corner blocks, plinth blocks, rosettes, fan tails, and jigger work in general. This was the only way they seemed to have, then, of putting on style. Unless the householder of the period were poor indeed, usually an ingenious corner tower on his house eventuated into a candle-snuffer dome a spire, an inverted rutabaga, or radish, or onion, or what is your favorite vegetable. Always elaborate bay windows and fancy porches played ring around a rosy on this imaginative corner feature. And all this the building of the period could do equally well in brick or stone. It was an impartial society, all materials looked pretty much alike in that day. Simplicity was as far from all this scrap pile as the pandemonium of the barnyard is far from music. But it was easy for the architect. All he had to do was call, boy, take down number 37 and put a bay window on it for the lady. So, the first thing to do was to get rid of the attic, and next, get rid of the unwholesome basement entirely. Yes, absolutely, in any house built on the prairie. Instead of lean brick chimneys, I could see necessity for one only, a broad, generous one kept low down on gently sloping roofs, 
or perhaps flat roofs. The big fireplace below, inside, became now a place for a real fire. It refreshed me to see the fire burning deep in the masonry of the house itself. Taking a human being for my scale, I brought the whole house down in height to fit a normal man. Believing in no other scale, I broadened the mass out all I possibly could as I brought it down into spaciousness. I am five foot eight and a half inches tall. It has been said that were I three inches taller, all my houses would have been quite different in proportion. Perhaps. House walls were now to be started at the ground on a cement or stone water table that looked like a low platform under the building. But the house walls were stopped at the second story window sill level to let the rooms above come through in a continuous window series. Here was true enclosure of interior space, a new sense of building, it seems. At this time, a house to me was obvious primarily as interior space under fine shelter. I liked the sense of shelter in the look of the building. I achieved it, I believe. Frank Lloyd Wright came to the Chicago area in 1887 and worked for Joseph Lyman Silsby, who was the foremost architectural practitioner of the shingle style in Chicago. In a sense, Silsby brought the style to Chicago from the East Coast, and it was very popular. It was a natural kind of architecture and quite picturesque, and it was therefore natural for Wright to use that style in his own first home. In 1889, at the age of 22, Wright met Catherine Tobin. The two were soon married, and Wright built a home for his new family at the corner of Forest and Chicago Avenues in Oak Park, a suburb of Chicago. At the time, this was the edge of Oak Park's westward development, and the house faced the woods. We're adequately anywhere defined organic architecture. And we've all tried to put words in his mouth over the years to do this, but I would say that what it means is working as closely as possible with nature in architectural design, that your building should work with nature. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright, when he came to Chicago, uh, was working for Silsby and heard about a job opening at uh, Louis Sullivan's office, and he went over there, and according to Wright, he showed him his drawings, and Sullivan was at a point in the design of the auditorium theater that he needed someone to take his sketches and develop them into something that could be used by the modelers in, in making the molds, and he liked what Wright did. I think he probably at that time saw uh, maybe the genius that Frank Lloyd Wright would become. And Frank Lloyd Wright said that he became the pencil in the master's hand. Principles are not invented, they are not evolved by one man of one age, but Mr. Sullivan's perception and practice of them amounted to a revelation at a time when they were commercially inexpedient and all but lost to sight in current practice. One of the things Wright learned from Sullivan was a real sensitivity toward nature, toward using Oh, say plant forms as models for ornament, for even for floor plans in his houses, and maybe in a larger sense, understanding that nature created in ways analogous to humans' process of creativity. What we must know in organic architecture is not found in books. It is necessary to have recourse to nature, 
with a capital N in order to get an education. Necessary to learn from trees, flowers, shells, objects which contain truths of form following function. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, loved nature. He writes about it in his autobiography. And the task for every designer using nature is to somehow translate it um, into something that is usable, because nature is seemingly chaotic. And so geometry is the way to do that. Wright looked to nature as his inspiration, but unlike Sullivan, he tended toward a more abstract, geometric treatment of the organic forms, as can be seen in the dining room of his home. Sullivan's ornament, there was more freedom in it. He used uh, curvilinear uh, elements drawn by hand and so forth. Right on the other hand, most of his work was done with a T-square and a triangle. Sullivan's 1891 residence for James Charnley shows the hand of his chief draftsman working alongside his own. There are people who argue that you know, the first modern building in architecture was the Charnley House, which of course was Louis Sullivan's house. Wright drew the drawings, but that's Louis Sullivan's design. Some of the stylistic features of Wright's buildings can be found in, in some of Sullivan's buildings and also in some of Henry Hobson Richardson's buildings. at Richardson's railroad stations, for example, you will see roofs and overhangs that remind one of Wright's prairie houses. Well, I think that Frank Lloyd Wright was looking at Richardson architecturally much more than Sullivan. And Richardson was not a great theorist. He didn't really write very much about what he was trying to create. Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings are based on a principle, on a theory, and Sullivan was one of the great American theorists in architecture. Wright often referred to Louis Sullivan as his Liebermeister, or beloved teacher. But the two had a falling out in 1893. Now on his own, the 26-year-old received several small commissions for homes. This Queen Anne reveals the architect's tendency to simplify exterior detailing. Windows of leaded glass are arranged in a continuous horizontal band. Here, the massive base of the home is made of large rough stones from the nearby river. In his remodeling of this Tudor, the overhanging porch roof protects the coach entrance and adds a horizontal emphasis. Hip roofs and broad eaves give a sense of shelter to this home. The architect preferred simple, natural materials like brick, stucco, or stained wood. Though he had been adapting traditional architecture, Wright soon began formulating an idea for an original American-style house based on Sullivan's organic principles. America, more than any other nation, presents a new architectural proposition. Her ideal is democracy. This means that she places a life premium upon individuality the highest possible development of the individual consistent with a harmonious whole. The Winslow House was the first true building of the Prairie School that Frank Lloyd Wright did. 
On the other hand, I don't think it was the first prairie school building. I believe that the first prairie school building was actually done by a man who has been a little, little acknowledged in the history of Chicago's architecture, and that's Dwight Perkins. Dwight Perkins designed the Washington Park Refectory Building. And if one looks at the refectory today, it has all the elements of the Prairie School. And it was finished in 1891, two years before the Winslow House. It has the Roman brick, it has the rhythmic arches, it has the overhanging roofs. I have no doubt that Wright saw it. He and Perkins were friends. And uh, I believe that the refectory as a commercial public building and the Winslow House as a private home were the two primary original buildings of the Prairie School of Architecture. Dwight Perkins' building of 1893 for the Steinway Piano Company became a gathering place for advocates of a new architectural movement. Among them was Frank Lloyd Wright. Perkins built Steinway Hall at Van Buren Street just off Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And in order to partly fill it up, he took space on the top floor and invited all his friends to join him. And what they did was share a drafting room. And this was very important in the uh, uh, genesis of the Prairie School because they were trading ideas. Frank Lloyd Wright seems to have had one of the really dynamic personalities coming out of this whole era. Uh, I think that's why people gravitated towards him. They knew that he was going to get good projects and that he was going to be able to defend his aesthetic ideas to the clients. He was going to be able to talk them into doing things that they probably would have never dreamed of doing on their own. To accommodate his growing practice, the architect built a studio adjacent to his home. Things really took a very interesting turn in 1898 when he added the studio because this was an experiment. It was not unlike his roots in Wisconsin where a farmer has a barn next to his house and he goes out and works, but he comes home at lunch and plays with the kids and so forth. And Wright wanted to combine his, his family life and his professional life, and, and he did it in that way. Several of the architects who had worked with Wright at Steinway Hall now followed him to the Oak Park studio. In Wright's own architectural office, there's Walter Burley Griffin at work. Griffin was a landscape designer and generally is, is credited with much of the early prairie landscape designs coming out of Wright's office. William Drummond was oftentimes sent out to the field to supervise the early construction. A freelance designer in his office was the young Marion Mahoney and she is the draftsperson who really creates the drawings that allows Frank Lloyd Wright to go to the client and say, here's what we really like to do. It's a marvelous coming together and a unique time in history when several people work together to come up with a composite whole. As a result, Frank Lloyd Wright ends up with much of the specific singular credit. The fact is that these houses are contributory designs that many people worked on, and it's, it, it can only really be likened to a Renaissance workshop. These young people have found their way to me through natural sympathy with the work and have become loyal assistants. For me, one real proof of the virtue inherent in this work will lie in the fact that some of the young men and women who have given themselves up to me so faithfully these past years will someday contribute rounded individualities of their own and forms of their own devising to the new school. In a series of articles for the Ladies Home Journal in 1901, Wright set forth to the public his ideal for a home in a prairie town. Built in 1901, the Bradley House in Kankakee, Illinois, strongly resembles a small house with lots of room in it, shown in the magazine series. Wright 
Wright and his associates had created a new vocabulary for residential designs. This house, built in 1902 for industrialist Ward Willits, is often cited as Wright's first mature prairie home. The Willits house is probably the first time Frank Lloyd Wright had a client who had a reasonable site, this was several acres, who had the money and the interest to allow him to put something together that had never been assembled before. Not only his stucco house, which reached out into the landscape, something he preached before, but also allowed him to do the complete interior. In terms of the style of the building, the low pitch roofs, the big overhangs, it's not the first, but in terms of Frank Lloyd Wright putting all of these factors together and coming up with one piece of work, I would say the Willis House is certainly the first of what we would call the masterpieces surfaces of the building, the ornament, abstraction of the glass, the bands of windows, the way that the spaces flow, all of those things are there. All of them are there. Wood it is universally beautiful to man. It is the most humanely intimate of all materials. Man loves his association with it, likes to feel it under his hand, sympathetic to his touch and to his eye. The Japanese understood it best. In Japanese architecture can be seen what a sensitive material, let alone for its own sake, can do for human sensibilities as beauty for the human spirit. Music may be for the architect ever and always a sympathetic friend whose counsels, precepts, and patterns even are available to him and from which he need not fear to draw. Wright's prairie homes had great appeal to an emerging class of businessmen and engineers who had themselves challenged tradition. He was addressing himself to an identifiable social class with very identifiable needs who wanted a certain kind of architecture and a certain kind of feel in their building and didn't particularly care about history. Many of his clients in the early days were engineers or had developed their own businesses. They saw the logic in what Frank Lloyd Wright was trying to do uh, as opposed to oh, what they might think of as being um, overly decorative, uh, the Queen Anne, for example. And, and so it was a sort of practicality, I think, that appealed to them. They were not the elite, they were not the Cyrus McCormicks. But they were not middle class either. These were a newly emerged wealthy class. These businessmen were seizing Wright's architecture, were attracted to Wright's architecture as a way of establishing their own artistic connoisseurship. They're grabbing onto the avant-garde here as a way of differentiating themselves from the real elite, which gravitated toward much more conservative design, historic design. So there's a social impetus behind attraction to the prairie style. The Dana House is a very complex issue 
in terms of the development of Frank Wright's career. He had been making kind of summary statements about what he wanted in architecture up to the year 1902-1903 when the Dana House is under construction. This house gave him a chance to do everything that he'd ever dreamed of doing as an architect. It became much larger, much more elaborate, much more costly, and becomes a kind of design laboratory. Mrs. Dana probably should have gone to a Springfield architect had she wanted something more conventional. And she had very good friends that had known her father that were architects. She chose not to use them. She chose a young, controversial architect from Oak Park to design her a house that was totally unique and, and very different. And I think she relished that role of being at the forefront of design in Springfield. There were many things that linked these two people. They were both willing to go against the convention of society. In the matter of decoration, the tendency has been to indulge it less and less. In many cases, merely providing certain architectural preparation for natural foliage or flowers, as it is managed in the entrance to the Dana House at Springfield. This use of natural foliage and flowers for decoration is carried to quite an extent in all the designs. And although the buildings are complete without this efflorescence, they may be said to blossom with the season. As with many right houses, in particularly conservative Midwestern communities, people didn't quite know what to make of it. It was called all kinds of things. It was referred to as a Japanese temple. It was called a Spanish pavilion. People knew that its ornament had some rooting in the Oriental, but they didn't know, you know quite what to, to make of it. When a thing is good from the standpoint of fine art, you may be sure that vital laws and organic requirements were not disregarded in its makeup. They were either intuitively felt or carefully taken into account. And whether it is a building, a painting, or a rug, its expression can only be beautiful when the rudiments of common honesty have been observed in its construction. I think one of the most important things that, that Frank Lloyd Wright learned from Louis Sullivan was the integrity of the building and how the building lives or dies by the fact that it fits together. Frank Lloyd Wright picked up with that same idea, repeated it, perhaps maybe even demanding more of, uh, of the client in terms of coordinating exterior and interior design, doing all the details, wanting wherever his client could afford it, as Mrs. Dana could, on a, on a really grand scale, uh, the ability to design all kinds of decorative items that would fit into those spaces, from the choice of, of drapery materials and colors, to the carpets, to uh, the built-ins, and the freestanding furniture, to the light fixtures, the art glass features, and windows and doors. Just a, a marvelous symphony of form. My father taught me to regard a symphony as an edifice of sound. And ever since, as I listened to Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, I have watched the builder build and learned many valuable things from music, another phase of understanding nature. Go to nature, thou builder of houses. Consider her ways and do not be petty and foolish. Let your home appear to grow easily from its sight and shape it to sympathize with the surroundings if nature is manifest there and if not try and be as quiet substantial and organic as she would have been if she had the chance
One of the interesting things about Frank Lloyd Wright is that he didn't just pursue one direction. He was constantly exploring many, many different ideas. And so some of his prairie houses look very different from each other because he was exploring these different ideas. But there were identifiable features common to them all. A horizontal orientation, deeply overhanging roofs, deep eaves, no excavation, no cellar, I should say. So the, the house sort of caresses and sits gently on the land rather than gouging it out. Spacious porches. Windows in continuous series. More windows than in other houses. Also very geometric, leaded glass, stained glass ornamentation. And on the interior, an open floor plan, or at least more open than had been the case for a few generations as one room flowed into the next. So the house was avant-garde in the sense that it, it seemed to reflect machine age, but at the same time it opened up and cherished nature more than most other places did. Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to get rid of the box, the house as a box and rooms as boxes, and to let the space flow in and out of the house out onto the verandas and the terraces and the landscape and the gardens and also from room to room. He was opening up the walls, both rooms to each other and the inside to the outside. But he didn't want to lose the sense of this great hovering roof that was protecting you. They have a very strong sort of protective feeling about them, almost like a cave. And once you're in this cave, you're sheltered from the physical world, you know, the world of the elements, but also perhaps a, a kind of hostile social world out there in the turn of the 20th century when cities were changing so rapidly. And what was the objective of the Prairie House? Nurture the family. In a sense, create a modern farmhouse where the family could sit around the kitchen stove, now the living room hearth, in a plan that opened up so that people on the first floor could see and sense each other everywhere. And in that sense, it was a very old-fashioned house. Frank Lloyd Wright saw the fireplace as the, the spiritual center of a home. And this, again, came somewhat from his roots on the farm, where there wasn't necessarily electricity or gas. And the fireplace was the cooking center and the source of heat and light. Stability represented by a, a warm hearth was always in his mind, and he always provided that for every one of his clients. We of the Middle West are living on the prairie. The prairie has a beauty of its own, and we should recognize and accentuate this natural beauty, its quiet level. Hence, gently sloping roofs, low proportions, quiet skylines, and sheltering overhangs, low terraces, and outreaching walls. I've, I've been interested for years in how Wright got people into his buildings. You know, you come in under a low roof into a little anteway, and, and then maybe you turn a corner, and then suddenly you burst out into a big space. He could get a person into his building better than anybody else. And his colleagues emulated him on that. This home, designed by William Drummond, leads the visitor up a few steps, turning behind a screening wall to enter the door. Turn again up several steps, and the open fireplace reveals a hint of the living room. Finally, turn again into the open space where a broad band of art glass windows frames the view outside.
basically what that term Prairie School refers to is a group of architects who had been Wright's apprentices for a while, supplemented by other architects, some of whom had worked for Louis Sullivan, supplemented by a third group of architects who had worked for neither and maybe didn't even live in Chicago, but were much impressed by the work and began to design in that manner. Walter Burley Griffin had his training at the University of Illinois, so he was already an architect when he came to work for Frank Lloyd Wright and then went on to do some wonderfully imaginative buildings, finally ending up winning the competition for the design of Canberra, the capital city of Australia. Anyone who's done any work in this field can recognize Griffin's work versus Wright's work. It's a little heavier, it's uh, more muscular, if you will. I don't want to suggest that it isn't as elegant. William, William Drummond, on the other hand, was sort of the other end of the spectrum from Griffin. His work was more delicate. I think that Marion Mahoney was even more tied to nature than Frank Lloyd Wright was. And you can see it in her renderings in Wright's studio, how the most delineated and detailed parts of her rendering were the trees and flowers and plants, and the buildings were almost these restful interludes of blank space. So to her, architecture should be subservient to nature, not compete with it. She was very rare. She was the first woman licensed as an architect in the United States, only the second woman to graduate with an architectural degree from MIT, and probably one of only a handful of women practicing in the United States in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Many architects outside of Wright's Oak Park studio were sympathetic to the prairie ideal as they developed their own unique variations. George Mayer is definitely part of the prairie school, but he kept to his own path, you might say. I believe Mayer and Wright actually worked for Silsby at the same time. You can identify a George Mayer house. It's clearly of the prairie school but it's very different from what Wright did. Many of his houses had uh, very similar details with the arched roof over the entry. He used, as the other members of the Prairie School did, leaded glass a great deal. He was a very fine architect. And then there are other individuals, uh, eventually in the early 20th century, the, the firms of Purcell and Elmsley, and Spencer and Powers, and Gonzell and Drummond. Many of these individuals were associated with either Sullivan or Wright in some capacity. Not that they necessarily worked for them, but they were very knowledgeable about their designs. William Gray Purcell and George Grant Elmsley both made enormous contributions, and there is a valid argument that the Purcell and Elmsley office was the, the real successor to Louis Sullivan. The estimates seem to be about 30 architects scattered across the Midwest who had no formal association, but who were identified as working in the same manner. And that manner was really invented by Wright. Others may have made variations, and some very nice variations in some cases, but basically the ideas came from Wright. 
There are some people who argue that Frank Lloyd Wright did it all and the rest were imitators. I don't believe that at all. I believe that Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, essentially first among a large number of equals. A school of architecture implies a lot of buildings by a lot of people who have a shared philosophy. And that's what happened. Up to about 1908 or 9 or so, Frank Lloyd Wright felt that he was, in fact, passing the torch to a new generation, although it wasn't a generation's age difference. But there came a moment in his life, for other reasons, that he began to think that those architects to whom he had passed the torch actually had stolen the torch. So it depends on what moment in time you look at Wright as to what his opinion about all this was. Even Louis Sullivan showed the influence of the style in his later department stores and small-town banks, though the ornament was unmistakably his own. Ladies' Home Journal series, Wright had earlier proposed construction of a fireproof house for $5,000, which would use reinforced concrete for walls, floors, and roof. The technique would now be used in the construction of Unity Temple in Oak Park. He had a problem with Unity Temple. Like most churches, uh, particularly Unitarian churches, they didn't have an awful lot of money, and uh, they wanted to do a quite a large building. And Frank Lloyd Wright realized almost immediately that the only way they could really build something like this was to use a very inexpensive material. He started off with the building committee and convinced several of the key members that what he was doing was really in the best expression of being conservative. He really appealed to their conservative spirit, even though it looked entirely different than anything they had seen. They could see the logic of the plan and the arrangement and the fact that he was using this new building material was economical and it was hard to argue with. Plus, Frank Lloyd Wright was, was a very persuasive man. The fundamental principle of all architecture is that the form must fit the function. A modern church building has a twofold purpose. It is erected for the worship of God and for the service of man. He wanted you to enter the auditorium through a lower level that you basically looked up through a little slot and could see a little bit of the room, it's intriguing. And then you would walk down the sides, not really being able to see this great room, and actually enter the auditorium then from the back, coming upstairs, but when you finally come up, into that great room, you're coming up into this marvelous light.
I think it is true that the Roby House is one of the finest expressions of the whole idea of the Prairie House. There's no superfluous ornamentation. It's a very rich building, but the integration is almost perfect. main space on the second floor with the living room and dining room, virtually one room separated only by this large fireplace. Almost a perfect expression of that one room idea that Frank Lloyd Wright had. Self-denial is imposed upon the architect to a far greater extent than upon any other member of the fine art family. The temptation to sweeten work to make each detail in itself lovable and expressive is always great, but that the whole may be truly eloquent of its ultimate function, restraint is imperative. Wright's fame had now spread to Europe, where the German publisher Ernst Wasmuth assembled a portfolio of drawings from the Oak Park studio. The Wasmuth portfolio became a manual of inspiration for the modernist movement. The Prairie School was the beginning of modern architecture in the world. I don't know any architect of merit today in the world that does not acknowledge uh, at the very least, a, a great appreciation of Frank Lloyd Wright. Vosmuth had invited Wright to Berlin to supervise production of his portfolio. In 1909, Wright abruptly departed Oak Park, his family and his practice, and traveled through Europe for two years with Mema Cheney, the wife of a former client. This absorbing, consuming phase of my experience as an architect ended about 1909. I had almost reached my 40th year. Weary, I was losing grip on my work and even interest in it. The Prairie architects continued designing in their manner for several years to come. But ultimately, the appeal of more picturesque, traditional houses returned to dominate the public taste. When he returned from Europe, the scandal Wright had created caused him to seek the sanctuary of his childhood home in Wisconsin. The architect built on a hillside there and dubbed the estate Taliesin, a Welsh word meaning shining brow. It's difficult to say, I think, when the Prairie period ended for Wright. Taliesin, I think, is the last great Prairie house. After that, the work is clearly in different kinds of styles. More dramatic elsewhere, perhaps more strange, more thrilling, more grand, too, but nothing picks you up in its arms and so gently, almost lovingly, cradles you as do these Wisconsin hills. In, in America, each man has a peculiar, inalienable right to live in his own house, in his own way. He is a pioneer in every right sense of the word, his home environment may face forward, may portray his character, tastes, and ideas, if he has any. An American is duty-bound to establish traditions in harmony with his ideals, his still unspoiled sights, his industrial opportunities. A truly noble architecture is a definite possibility so soon as Americans really demand it of the architects of the rising generation. <laughs>